This is the Wally and Mathot Show, powered by Barhaven Ford. Now here are your hosts, Brent Wallace and Mark Mathot. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. It is episode 23. I'm Brent Wallace. He's 13-year NHL veteran defenseman, Mark Mathot. Now, Meth, you and I are super happy to announce that today we have finally acquired our top first-line center to our sponsorship lineup. As We are proud to announce the addition of Barhaven Ford as our title sponsor. Perfect timing, really, because Barhaven Ford is excited to announce it has launched its very own highly anticipated lineup of Barhaven Ford Customs. Custom builds on F-150s, Rangers, and Mustangs. They are the first and only dealership in Ottawa, Matt, to feature the Roush-inspired custom builds. Go check them out. Biggest inventory in Ottawa. Beautiful spot near Costco and Barhaven, 555 dealership drive. Welcome aboard Barhaven Ford. Barhavenford.com slash BFC dash customs. Tell them meth sent you. Right, don't wait. Don't do that. That's probably going to cause a lot of confusion. Uh, tell them Wally sent you and you might get a free stuntman's two autograph. Hey, meth. We both They're drive great. F-150s, right? We love f one Yeah. And I got a chance to drive one of the Roush inspired uh, trucks at the dealership. It was awesome. Had a good time with stuntman Stu. Lots of exciting news in the show today. Uh, you just finished wrapping up a weekend in Toronto covering the World Championships, your big national TV debut. We're going to talk about that in just a sec. Also coming up in the chat room, pre presented by whitewaterbeer.ca. Don't forget to use the Wally Mathot coupon, 15% off. Um, we're going to talk to former Senators head coach Dave Cameron. Actually, it's going to be me talking to Senators head coach Dave Cameron. You were a little busy on the weekend, so I took care of it for you. Don't worry. Um, good man. So we got a good chat with Dave Cameron coming up. Uh, and of course... We're going to talk to Meth about picking uh, who he's got in game three of the Leafs and Habs in sportsinteraction.com slash Wally Mathot. Of course, trivial trivia. I don't know how many gong show sauce off kits you stole from the gong show uh, warehouse in the F-150, if you will, but I'm happy you <laughs> did. It is outstanding. We got another one to give away today. Uh, but first, as always, Meth, you know, it's the headlines today presented by Faces Magazine. Check out their latest issue with Meth on the cover. Yeah, like you need more exposure. Uh, Facesmag.ca. All right, here we go. World premiere. Mark makes his national TV debut. We'll see what it's like when the lights go up. Uh, Leafs and Habs, what's next as the series switches to Montreal? The Tavares aftermath. How do you play through a game with a serious injury like that where you see a player leave on a stretcher? Kadri's carelessness. An eight-game suspension for Nazem Kadri in the postseason. That is a long, long suspension. I'm just curious to get Mess thoughts on how long he really thinks that is. And learning to win in the postseason. What do you have to understand to win in the playoffs. All right, Matt, let's start. What's it like sitting on the big set at Studio 6 in Toronto covering the World Championship? I don't even know why you're asking me this because you've got more experience than anybody I know doing this for a living. But no, I, I've got a healthy new respect for it. It's uh, it's incredibly difficult. Um, the timing, the cues with the cameras, um, feeding off your co-host, the anchor, and all that stuff. It's 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 not easy. And you're like, I, I've been up now, I think, for uh almost 18 hours uh, so the eyes are burning a bit at the moment but again a healthy respect for it it's not easy at all but it's a, it's been a great experience so far what's it like when someone's talking in your ear while you're trying to actually complete a <laughs> sentence <laughs> well the earpiece kept falling out so <laughs> half the time when the producer was trying to tell me to wrap up a, a sentence i just kept talking or maybe i just stopped up a little shorter than i had to um I was always sweating on camera. I mean, I enjoyed it, but I'm not used to wearing a suit for that long. You know, in, in hockey, you wear it from the hotel to the arena. You take it off immediately. You maybe have it on for 30 minutes. But having it on for 12 plus hours is a long time. Again, healthy respect for the job. Did you uh, keep the receipt on that tie, by the way? I'm just curious. <laughs> You're not the only one that made fun of it. But my wardrobe sucks. It does. Uh, I my last three years in the NHL, I refused to buy suits or ties. I just I told myself I'm not buying any more of this crap. I don't need it, and so now I'm paying for it. So it's it is what it is. Uh, I thought you did a great job. So congrats, my friend. We look forward to seeing uh, you do some more work with the World Championships coming up soon. All right, uh, moving on to Leafs and Habs tonight's game three. Uh, where do you see this going as now the series switches to Montreal? Oh well, I. I... I like the last leaf performance that they played much more like we all expected them to be. Yeah. And it's just a dominant powerhouse offensively with five tucks. Can't complain with that. And I think I'd like to think that first game was maybe an outlier. One of those situations where, you know, with the unfortunate events that happened with John Tavares, it was an emotional game, a lot of pressure on the Leafs. 
Um, so maybe it took them a game to settle in, which typically isn't always a great strategy in the postseason. But I mean, what do you say after that second game? I think all the momentum is on their side. I'm just curious if they put Cole Caulfield in the lineup, which I'm not sure they're going to, but it Release would be the Caulfield. It would be interesting to see the momentum that they would generate, right? Like you would just get something from that. You have to, you have to play him at this point. And I know it was a very controversial move at the beginning and it paid off. Ducharme and, and Bergevin looked like geniuses, yeah. right? And then uh, of course um, that second game, I think they came back down to reality and so I think, you know, at this point, put in your goal scores. Caulfield's a dynamic player. He has like, what is he at? Like four or five goals in those 10 games played? Whatever it is, I know he can score goals. And he's got about half a point a game on average right now in that short period of time. What do you have to lose? I mean, he's that X factor, perhaps. Yeah. And at this point, they have nothing to lose. Goal Caulfield, they call him. Okay. The Tavares <laughs> aftermath. I just want to know as a player, uh, you can tell me from either the Toronto or the Montreal side, but probably the Toronto side of what it's like to try and pick up and play and that happened in the first period. You've got to try and will this way through this game. And your headspace, I'm going to assume, is nowhere near playing this hockey game. Yeah, and, and it's 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 funny because when you're in the post, like I've never experienced a situation like that in the playoffs. I've been around many situations where players have been knocked out uh, briefly uh, by hitting their head on the ice, typically after fights. But it's scary. And it's, it, it, it's deflating for the group. Cause you're sitting there on the bench and all you're concerned about is your bud that's laying there almost kind of motionless to a degree. Now Tavares, thankfully was responsive after a little while and motioned to the crowd or rather the cameras with the thumbs up, which was nice, but it's really hard to bounce back from a game like that because, and especially in this case, he's your team captain. He's laying there motionless on the ice. Yeah. And uh, I mean, he's a heck of a player. He's a contributor on that team. So again, that affects the team in many ways, emotionally probably being the, the biggest one. So um, I guess you just chuck that game as a wash and move on to the next. And they did a great job of that game too. What did you think of the coverage afterwards of all the replays and, and uh, everybody wants to talk yeah. about the sun, the Toronto sun yeah. cover, which I, so you're a player, you've got a family, you've got a wife at home. You've got a kid now that can see the paper and see what's going on. Uh, yeah. Are you a little perturbed of what they did? And do you, or do you understand yeah. that that's what sells newspapers? Well, I think you can agree with me. I mean, obviously you've been in media for a long time. It was disgusting. And it, it actually angered me a little bit. And I can understand, you know, this is the media and, and nowadays clicks sell. And if you have a very boring vanilla front cover, no one's going to click on it, right? And that's not what generates money. Unfortunately, that's the world we live in now. And the integrity in journalism in, in many cases is almost gone, right? People are just looking for those clicks to generate more money. And that's how the big machine keeps rolling. And unfortunately, uh, you know, John, I mean, I met him, I played with him at the world championships. Yeah. He didn't deserve that. And I mean, I think the good thing is people responded accordingly and, and called yeah. them out on it. But at the same time, that just generates more discussion. And again, you know, that's, that's probably what the newspapers want. I did appreciate though, that I think it was the Toronto star that just showed uh, the Tavares with a thumbs up leaving on the stretcher, which tells yeah, you everything that's all that you need to know. Right. But so I, I know yeah. I'm probably talking out of both sides of my mouth because I've been in that industry for so long, but I was never sure. one to try and glorify what transpired on the ice. It always bothered me. And I, I sat there and I thought of yep. like his family, you just do that. And, and it's very uncomfortable. And so I'm and it's, not a big it's fan. funny you bring that up, Wally. Yeah. It's funny you bring that up just to touch on it really quickly. I never thought of the family angle. And to me, I can only imagine if my wife and kids had to see a cover like that, a very yeah. big paper published across the nation. Anyway, it's, it's disgusting. We can move on from it. It is tough. I, I mean, hopefully maybe something good comes to this where people now start to realize of what they should put on the front cover may not necessarily be that the worst thing photo you can find to stick on the cover to sell that story. All right. Uh, right. Nazem Kadri, who I believe you know as well, uh, eight game yep. suspension in the postseason, an eight game suspension in the playoffs. So usually they say it's four to one, four regular season games for one playoff game. Uh, that's like 32 yeah. games. Do you agree? Is it finally time now that George Peros is sending messages or like we talked about the Tom Wilson stuff and all that, but where are you at now? Is that an excessive uh, punishment for Nazem Kadri, who's a repeat offender, if you will? Yes. And I think that you have to create an app or rather a culture that allows like that almost is zero tolerance when it comes to hits like that. You have to focus on protecting the players. You make a really, a really good point there with, player safety, perhaps being a little late to the, to the dance, if you will, 
you know, they're, they're, they've, they've had opportunities throughout the year to make these types of calls, to really send a message to the league, a clear message that they're not going to tolerate those types of hits anymore. Uh, I mean, with Kadri, he's a repeat offender, if you mentioned. I've actually been on the receiving end of one of his high hits. There was no call on the play. Back in Ottawa, he ran me when I was not really paying attention. There was a puck battle. Puck was between my legs. My back was up against the wall. He caught me really. He, I think he lunged and jumped at me and hit me in the face. And it was I was dazed for a bit. I, I probably concussed. I, I don't know. But in any case, um, I'm happy that he's going to get that eight games. I hear, or the word is rather, that he may appeal it. Uh, I don't know where that's going to take him. I think I don't think too many people feel too bad. Again, from the individual's perspective, yes, yeah. it sucks. You don't want to miss eight games in the playoffs. But you're responsible for your actions. What's his reputation like in the league as a player? He's fine. He's he, you know like yeah. We we know that, a, that occasionally he'll be a little reckless and might take a late run at a guy. But I mean, to me, it doesn't need to be part of his game game it's unnecessary you got a guy like tom wilson i can understand that he's unpredictable he's dangerous he's imposing nazem kadri is a good hockey player not to say tom wilson isn't but nazem kadri doesn't need to have that in his repertoire if you will or his tool set i mean it's an, it's an unnecessary thing it's dirty and he's a skilled guy he doesn't need to be doing that in the first place when i'm skating out there rather when i was skating out there i was never worried about where nazem kadri was so I guess it's just one of those things. It's part of his game and it's embedded in his DNA where he's got this little thing where the wires cross and he decides to lunge at a guy and hit him in the face. But he's got these serving a game, so uh, justice was served. Extremely talented player. Uh, before this suspension, five yeah. times, 27 games, plus another three times he was fined. Um, it's an interesting way that he plays the game, but it, no question he's a talented player. Uh, how much does that hurt your team yeah. uh, to see someone like that being taken out of your lineup? Like, are you... Are you, as your teammate, are you pissed? Yes, hundred percent. You are. You think it's selfish. I mean, what else? Well, I mean, and I, I hate critiquing guys like this because I'm a former player, and it almost feels like I'm stabbing guys in the back. But it's the truth. I mean, really. And I would, I would call myself out on this. If I take an eight game suspension and I'm a key player on a hockey team in the postseason, no less a Stanley Cup contender, then yes. It's selfish. I don't care how you put it. And if you're a teammate, it is it messes up your lines. It yeah. jumbles all your lines up. So now you got to get guys on lesser lines in. You got to bring a guy who is sitting back into the lineup. Your bottom three lines now are all messed up. The chemistry is all messed up. You're playing with new faces. It really has a, a pretty serious trickle down effect, especially when you're playing on an established team like Colorado. So again, a very unfortunate event. It is what it is. All right. Uh, and right now, Colorado doesn't need them, but I'm assuming the deeper they get, they're going to need some really talented players in their lineup. Okay. Uh, finally, oh, yeah. learning to win in the postseason. What do you have to do as a young team to start to realize how to win? Like when you guys faced uh, Sidney Crosby the very first time, you guys handled him pretty easily. But as Pittsburgh got better and they started to learn, they also went on to win Stanley Cup. So what do you have to take away from the first time you're in the postseason? Get past the nerves. And that's where your leadership comes in. So if you're talking, for example, a team like Toronto, where they've had some issues moving forward out of that first round, it's simple. You, you look to guys like Joe Thornton, Jason Spezza, Wayne Simmons, the list goes on. You've got a lot of guys that can be vocal in the room, try to keep players calm. But more importantly than all of that, stick to your assignments. I think that if you're a player, you're responsible of going into that game, doing all your homework, knowing who you're going to be matching up against, because you better believe you're going to be facing those same players, typically the same lines even, every other night when you're playing in the series. So for me, it was simple. I looked up and down the lineup. I looked at all the right wingers that I'd be facing up against, learned their tendencies, particularly those top two lines and how to shut them down. And, I mean, you just play as hard as you can. You give it your all. And you got to make sure that your third-line guys, your fourth-line guys are playing just as, just as an important role as your top two-line guys. Everybody needs to contribute in the postseason because, quite frankly, oftentimes, and we're starting to see it, those top lines can get shut down. So you're going to rely on that secondary scoring from all the bottom lines, and, and it's it's just the way it is. It's it's a team effort. And that's what I love about the postseason, those bottom two lines, the guys who don't ever get the attentions, uh, get the attention, start to finally score some goals or make some plays, and they're the ones that get all the attention in the postseason. Like they need that guy, or the Jean Gabriel Pajot was a perfect example of a guy who emerged in the postseason. All right, uh, great job, Matt. Those yep. 
are the headlines presented by Faces Magazine. New articles posted all the time. Go to facesmag.ca. All right, time for a quick break. When we come back, I go one-on-one because Matt took the day off. Uh, with Dave Cameron, brought to you by whitewaterbeer.ca. Use the Wally Mathot coupon, get it home delivery as well. Don't forget, 15% off on beer. Um, what a setup. Whitewater Beer Brew proudly by friends, for friends. You're watching the Wally Mathot Show, powered by Bar Haven Ford. Check out the new BFC custom vehicles at 555 Dealership Drive. Where else? Bar Haven. Welcome back to the Wally Mathot Show, powered by Bar Haven Ford. Bar Haven Ford has launched their highly anticipated all star lineup of custom builds. It's the all new BFC lineup. Bar Haven Ford has brought Roush inspired custom F 150s, Rangers, and Mustangs to the nation's capital. At Bar Haven Ford, they build the truck or Mustang the way you want it. Choose from countless different build scenarios, customizing each truck or Mustang to fit your needs and into one sweet ride. The largest inventory in the Ottawa region. Go to barhavenford.com slash bfc customs today. Time now for the chat brought to you by whitewaterbeer.ca. Uh, pleased to be joined now by former Ottawa Senator head coach and now the current coach of the Vienna Capitals in a beautiful, beautiful city in Vienna, Austria. I had the pleasure of hanging out with you a couple of years ago in that city. Dave Cameron, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks, Frank. Good to be here. Okay, so you're back in PEI after. I'm assuming what's been a different season for you as well in Vienna with COVID. How was it like to coach over in Europe compared to, I guess, what it's been like here with the, the COVID restrictions? How did you have to handle it? Actually, well, we, we were very fortunate in that our league probably was one of the three or four leagues that had what we would call a normal season, if you can call anything normal during this COVID thing. But uh, we started we started in September, and we actually when we started – in Vienna, we had fans. I recall 7,000. We were allowed uh, 2,000 fans to start. Uh, but then as, as conditions tightened up a little bit, there was no fans. Uh, we were all right. We got through. But the third week in October, there's 11 teams in our league. And at that point, nine of the 11 got hit, with, got hit with the COVID. So what we did as a league is we shut down for three weeks. And because every team or the majority of teams, nine out of the 11, had it, uh, the three weeks shut down. We condensed the schedule. And when we got up and got running again, everything went real smooth uh, because, again, most of the players had it, and therefore no team had to uh, miss games or reschedule a whole lot of games. And we went right through the regular season, right through our pick round and playoffs, and the only thing missing was the fans. Okay, I, what what is a pick round? A pick round is where – so there's 11 teams in our league. And so after the season, there's 11. So what they do then is the pick round is kind of a play-in round. So what you do in this case, because there's a non-even number of teams, so you took the top five teams. So what they did is they played a home and away series against one another. So there's eight additional games. So at that point, all the points that you accumulated during the regular season in the standings are wiped clean. You start to pick round with bonus points, depending on where you finish. So the first place team starts with four bonus points, the second place team three, the third place team two, and then that's it. So then you play the home and away, each game is worth three points. And then at the end of that pick round, those top five teams are reseeded based on the points that they accumulated through that with the added bonus points in. Well, the same thing happens in the bottom six, except in the bottom six, the top, the bottom two teams are eliminated. So now that leaves you with eight teams total, right? You got your top five. They're just re resorted. You got your bottom six and three teams come out of that. So that gives you eight teams that are in the playoffs. It's called the pick round because the first place team picks who they play. Now they can't they can't pick any of the top three teams. So they, they get to pick who they play, and then the second place team, then the third place team picks, and then of course that leaves you fourth and fifteen. So it adds a little bit of intrigue uh, to to the uh, to the matchup because right away there's there's dressing room bulletin board stuff, right? Because you have to pick your team. But a lot of it is in too is that because because uh, 
the games are usually usually one home, one away, even in the playoffs, no matter no matter the travel. So geographics comes into that and all that. So uh, it, it's really interesting. So that's the pick round. And then the playoffs in after that, uh, you have to win three best of seven. It is fascinating. Okay, so when you decided to take the job in Vienna, you're going from the NHL now to Europe. What was the biggest change or challenge that you had to face? Well, obviously, the big, the biggest challenge uh, in in the Austrian league because that's what this league is. Primary Austrian teams, although, although we have some teams as mother countries, but the primary Austrian. So it's a top league in Austria. The reality of it is, with the nine Austrian teams, there's not enough high end Austrian players to keep all nine teams uh, really competitive. So the way the league works is that the the form your roster you're allowed a total of 60 points. So each import, so each non-Austrian player counts four on your total. Then then there's a then there's a method, I to this day I can't figure out how they would, but then there's a method, an algorithm how they rate the Austrian players. So they're rated anywhere from anybody under the age of 24 counts as zero because they want you to develop the young Austrians. And then as they play in the league, depending on how good they are, they're assigned a number two. So at the end of the day, when you put all your players down and put the, the number beside them, it can't exceed 60. And, and so what makes this league really strong, the top teams have the best Austrians because that gives you your depth. Uh, the imports, for the most part, because there's lots of imports want to come over, but the imports, for the most part, wipe one another out. So the best teams have the best Austrians. And that's that's what makes the, the the best teams the best because the Austrians give them give them that depth. And What's so, the, my, the, sorry, Dave. the big thing about it, the big thing about the Austrians is that then because it's a saturated market for them, they don't really push themselves because they know they know that for the most part they're going to play in the league. And so there's no real pressure from underneath to be a real good Austrian. They just say, hey, if you don't like me, I'll just go to another team. So the big challenge for me, I guess, was trying to coach a team where there's really no inner competition for them to be the best. Interesting. So uh, in the NHL, usually the star players have all the say or all the power, if you will, compared to the coach, because it's easier to get rid of the coach. Do you have more power as a coach uh, in Austria? Uh, I, I have a good staff in Austria because I like, I like who I work for. The owner's a real good guy. The GM's a real good guy. And, and my GM and I, are, are on the same page and we both like the same type of players, same type of team. So I have a lot of input uh, in, in terms of, in terms of what goes on. Uh, and it certainly makes it easier when you, as any coach will tell you, if, if the GM and the coach is on the, on the same page. Uh, so the, the imports, I, Austrians is a drawing card. Uh, we, the city, the, the city itself is a big drawing card, the fans, the organization and stuff like that. So, we we have no we have no real uh, trouble with getting good imports and stuff of that in, but where the trouble comes in our league, our league is that uh, there's there's no there's no such thing as as uh, tampering in our league, and as this happens in Europe too. This is the other thing that's hard to get used to is that you can have a player on your team, you start the year with a player, a real good player, and any team other team in Europe can sign him during the season. So it's not it's not out of this world for you to have a player playing for you that already is going to play with another team the next year, and you may meet that team in the playoffs. So that that whole loosey goosey thing about how these guys can move around, and there's a big discrepancy in our league between uh, the top teams what they pay and and what what the lesser teams, the smaller community teams pay. So, for example, this year this year I lost my my top import. And two of my top Austrian young Austrian players, the Salzburgs, just said because Salzburg opened up the checkbook. Salzburg Red, and we we just couldn't match it. So uh, out the out the door they go. So it's a little bit different than that in terms of being able to hold on to players. So was it a, like a huge, almost learning curve just on the outside of coaching hockey of just how it all worked? Yeah, the hockey is pretty basic. I mean, I had a pretty good idea of the European hockey because all the work I'd done with Hockey Canada, like yeah. the size of the ice and, and the arenas and the mindset and stuff like that. So the actual 
systems and that were, were pretty straightforward. But yeah, but trying to get my head around like uh, you know what drives these guys and and once I realized once I realized that there's no real there's no real loyalty from the players. I mean, it's all they're all about. They're just going to go where their mighty dollar goes, which you don't blame them. It's it's the business point, but but it's it's really hard when there's no underneath push. When there's no underneath push from these guys that compete. Like if we don't like all the years I ran my junior teams, uh, if if a player you know didn't if it didn't have the interest in it, well then you just you could replace him. You could go out and replace him. It's a lot harder to do that here in Austria. Okay, I want to switch back over to North America, but I want to start with your playing career as opposed to getting to the uh, the Sens in your NHL career and your coaching career, which I think you coached like 900 teams, but I, I might be exaggerating one or two teams. Is is when you first started playing, uh, you played for the Colorado Rockies. And I'm just curious of what that was like. Young kids think I'm a baseball player. I tell them I played for Colorado Rockies. I don't know what position I played. Yeah, I played one year there. Uh, it was it was right after it was right after the uh, Don Cherry. Uh, they, they changed coaches right after Don. So I miss I missed Don. Played there one year. They were sold uh, the year I was there. Became the New Jersey Devils, and we moved we moved to New Jersey. So for me, for me, I mean, uh, it was a really exciting time for me because I mean I was fulfilling my lifetime dream of playing in the National Hockey League. And uh, again, Denver was a beautiful city. Coming from the East Coast, the mountains were majestic. Um, so it was, it was for me, a, a real fun time, a real exciting time. And um, it's funny, as you look back now over that team, and I look at my teammates on that team and how many of them went on to become, become head coaches in the National Hockey League. Joel Quinville was on that team. Uh, Mike Kitchen was on that team. Donnie Lever, I think, was on that team. Uh, all guys went on to be, to be head coaches and things like that. So it's kind of ironic that one. Uh, one of the, or I guess your head coach, I don't know if you had both of them, but you had Marshall Johnston, who was the former Ottawa Senator general manager, as a head coach. I think it was the only time he was a head coach. What was he like as a head coach? He's a very meat and potatoes guy of, of anybody I've ever met. And so uh, what was he like to play for? And a great, great guy. Real yep. real quiet, you know, real quiet. Quiet in that in that. Bob Gainey type of quiet, you know, confident, uh, you know, had no ego, uh, was very comfortable in his own skin, uh, didn't say a whole lot, but when he spoke, uh, you know, had instant credibility, even keeled, uh, never, never got too fired up and just a real classy gentleman. Uh, your first NHL goal, I came, I think four games into your NHL career. What do you remember about that goal? What do you remember about that game? I think you're playing the Los Angeles Kings. Yeah, it was it was uh, October 1981. I think like that. Oh, there you go. The kids gave me gave me that puck and stuff like that. Uh, if I remember correct, I I think I would have to go back to check, but I think I got a pass from the from US Olympia. I think it was Billy Billy Baker. Yes, he's an assist uh, that, on the goal. Yeah, he, he assists on the goal. And uh, uh, who was the goal? Was Jimmy Rutherford the goalie? I was gonna, I was gonna ask if you remembered who your goaltender was. Yes, it was Jim Rutherford. Yeah, Jimmy Rutherford. That's that's why I never get any opportunity in Carolina, or Pittsburgh. I guess when I looked at <laughs> looked down the road. But no, it was it was a uh, it was a pass in the slot. And it was just like most of my shots. Closed my eyes, and I was fortunate enough that I went in and just. Uh, as you can imagine, coming from PEI and dreaming of playing the National Hockey League, the first goal, first goal was uh, was just unbelievable stuff like that. And but you know, probably the highlights of my career, or the most exciting part of my career. I remember when the first time I went and played in the old Maple Leaf Gardens or the old Montreal Forum, uh, the pregame skates. I, I literally stayed on half hour, forty five minutes after everybody left to just skate around, shop pucks because. I grew up in hockey in Canada. That was the only teams, you know, really that we got on the island. And uh, just to be able to be to be on that ice, and and uh, I savored every moment of it. Was it tough in Colorado to have that, like, the game you scored in, you lost 10-2. to two. And there was a lot of those nights I seen that, I don't know if there were seven or eight games where you guys allowed nine goals or more. Like, is that tough to try and play through? 
Yeah, well, for sure. But but it, it was probably a little bit easier for me because it was my first year and I, I was all excited about it. And but I, but I do remember I do remember that year that year that there was there was a lot of a lot of turmoil uh, off the ice around the team. Uh, I think we changed coaches. I think yep. uh, Marshall Johnson came in because Bert Marshall got fired. Uh, I know there was a lot of a lot of uh, player coach unrest on on that team, and you know part of it probably was due to the fact that the team was leaving. Um, so yeah, so it was it was. But I being being the new kid on the block, you know, just a matter of if I didn't get involved in any of that, really had no interest in it at that time. We're just trying to establish a career. But yeah, any any time you play, it doesn't matter. Uh, I don't think you get anywhere in hockey if you're not competitive. And there's nothing there's nothing that takes takes the the fun of the game any more than than losing and losing all the time. And I think people forget that sometimes. Though they all look at all the luxuries you have of playing in the National Hockey League and that, but still, uh, you know the players are competitive. If they're not winning for the most part. They're not happy and. Certainly, certainly at uh, you know that time too, it was uh, uh, the monetary value and stuff like that wasn't anywhere close to what it is now. Uh, what was it like to go up against Wayne Gretzky and the Edmonton Oilers? There was a game in New Jersey, I think, the following year. You guys lose thirteen to four. Gretzky's got eight points. Curry's got, I think, five goals and one assist or something ridiculous. Like, uh, were, were you just hoping you didn't have to see them for a whole lot of time? Like. Well, how do you how do you play against Wayne Gretzky? Well, that that game that game was in Edmonton, and if I remember correct, I think we were up to nothing. I think you scored and, the opening goal, perhaps. Yeah, I I had, I had scored it, so it was. But then it, it was just it was just a case, uh, and then Gretzky was really upset after he called the Mickey Mouse organization. And well, the, that's the, the game. Re- yeah, the big reason being that that. Uh, Ronnie Lowe was our goaltender, who was the next Oiler, right? So they, they felt really, really bad for Ronnie. And, and well, they should have. But I, I think it was just, it was a case, it's a case that I think of all teams that, that are down and out and struggle. Um, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of turmoil. You know, there, there's a lot of stuff going on, going on behind the scenes. And, and there's, no, there's, no real, there's no real game plan. And I think at that point, at that point, I think they probably started to realize that, you know, the proper way to do things, do things is through the draft and make sure you get some young guys and bring them in. At that point, uh, I think it started to turn. There was, there was a big, there was a big, um, I don't know if it was that year or not, but when I was winding down my career there, it was the year that Mario Lemieux was coming into the league. And so it was Pittsburgh and New Jersey at that time that was kind of uh, the bottom two teams and who was going to get them. And basically, Pittsburgh did the smart thing in that they, they just tanked. They just brought up the American League team. And I think at the end, at the end, in the last month, we might have played that team three times. And of course, we, we, we should have probably went along the same lines, but we were still beating the drum about, you know, we're, we're competitive, we're not going to lose, we're never not going to compete. And uh, and uh, we ended up getting Kirk Muller, who's a hell of a hockey player. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he's no he's no Mario Lemieux, and, and Kirk would be the first guy that would tell you that too, right? And so Pittsburgh kind of took off from there. But that was also the, the point where New Jersey started bringing in Pat Verbeek, Joey Sorella, John McLean was their first round pick, and that's when they started to kind of turn in the corner. Uh, you played, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 168 games. So I apologize if that number is wrong. How would you assess your NHL career? Just did you were you able to enjoy it? I mean, you're a guy that played at the University of PEI and found a long, hard road to get to the NHL. So while you may not have had the wins, uh, where would how would you assess your career that way? Well, I, I think I, I obviously I was I was kind of like well, I guess what we were calling now a tweener. I I was I was a good uh, minor minor league player, uh, and I was a I was a part time, a fourth line in another lineup uh, NHL player, and uh, very competitive. Had to had to uh, make the team every year. Uh, there never was a time when I went into camp where. I was guaranteed a spot and stuff like that. No different than a lot of guys that are doing it now. So it, it was a it was a case for me where 
Um, I fulfilled my dream. I was very excited about it, but obviously, you know, disappointed. Would have liked to have, for it to have been uh, a little bit longer. Oh, for sure, and no question. So, when did you know that you wanted to be a head coach? Well, I, I always, I always, uh, I guess you could always say I always had a lot to say, and anywhere, anywhere that I was, you know, I always had an opinion. So, uh, but, but. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if anything ever went on, but I do know through my playing, playing days when when I come home in the summers, uh, the big pastime for us when we're coming up to a high school university was fast pitch ball, and every community had a team and we had a team. And I grew up at a time where where there was a good cycle of of athletes uh, that was in my range. So so we were always competitive in our little community, whether it was high school hockey against the bigger schools or it was on the ball field or whatever. Uh, we were always competitive, and because we were probably young and a little bit yappy, nobody ever really wanted to coach us. And so I was on the team, and, and my four brothers played at one time. And so finally, enough was enough. And because I was living there year round, I was even in the winter. I was probably the safest guy to coach. And so I always tell everybody that was one of the toughest coaches you have trying to coach my four brothers because uh, they didn't mind telling me. <laughs> You know what they thought, but uh, so I, I kind of get into that. I liked it, and then once I retired uh, in '85, uh, there was an opportunity to coach a tier two team in Summerside, on uh, the Western Capitals, and uh, Jimmy Clark, the pro scout in Ottawa, was the GM, and so I coached that team. And that 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 team, Dougie McLean uh, was the first coach of that team. Jawar Gallant coached that team. Uh, so uh, it's, it was a well-established tier two uh, league. And uh, so I, I coached that and uh, loved it. Uh, just loved it. And uh, so I kind of got the bug and uh, it just went from there. Okay. I'm going to get to your NHL uh, coaching career in a sec, but you just said that you had a lot to say. And I want to pick a bone with you right now because yeah. when you and I would do interviews in the pregame interview, you would come in all happy, all funny, lots of jokes, and then boom, we start to do the interview. You've got like three words to say. Now, can you? This is a perfect time to apologize to me. Yeah, you know, you, Gordon Wilson, I owe an apology to for sure because because uh, I I love talking and, and I love talking hockey and probably a little too cautious because as you know, uh, at the NHL level, one wrong slip up. Uh, you say the wrong thing, and uh, you know you're out the door, or or it's it's twisted the wrong way. So I I probably was a little too defensive that way, and I always I always pushed the team, uh, things like that. But uh, deep down, deep down, what I was saying and what I wanted to say wasn't always correlated. So I do apologize, both you and Gord. I, I I knew I'm like I'm asking these questions like that's not even close to the actual answer he should be given. But you came in, you'd be like doing shadow puppets and we'd be, Oh yeah. Anyway, uh, I appreciate it all the time we had a, off the camera anyway. So I wasn't, you, I wasn't around long enough to learn from that. <laughs> it's, and I do miss you. So uh, yeah. what was it like to step behind the bench for your first NHL game? Well, again, again, when, when you get into coaching, pe people ask me when I get into coaching, like right off the hop, they say, Oh, you want to go to the NHL? And of course you do. But but being being there as a player and and being uh, you know kind of uh, aware of what's going on, my answer always used to be yes, I do. I said, but I I also knew I wanted to make sure I was prepared when I got there because you knew you knew if you got there it may only be a short window and stuff like that. And of course, didn't like the fact how I got there. I didn't like the fact that that Paul, uh, who I worked under, learned a lot from uh, you know. Got got let go, and then I then I came in and took that. I, I didn't like that circumstances, but I think anytime you reach the upper echelon, um, you know the, the, you're, you're excited in that. But uh, then you know that that now all of a sudden, as the head guy, you have a lot more skin in the game, and you know there's a lot more accountability and stuff like that. But again, that that never that never intimidated me. I, I knew that going way back as a player, or whatever that that your name's on the dotted line. So game on. But are you able to enjoy it? Because there's so much pressure to be a, an NHL head coach. And you just said like, everybody's trying to get your job and the way you get it is someone else leaves. Is there a time where you're able to enjoy it? Because 
when you're like your team, you weren't blessed with the, the greatest Ottawa Senators group that you've ever had. So I'm just curious of what that's like. Can you sit in your office and go, yeah, it's a pretty good day today? Yeah, you did. You did it some days because because it's about ebb and flow, right? It's it's yeah. about the high high low. Uh, it it always it Ottawa was a was a little more difficult because there there always seemed to be a crisis. You know, it, there always there always was a crisis in Ottawa. Uh, there was very few days when when there was smooth sailing. And James Boyd and I used to have the rule we coached together in Mississauga. If we had two consecutive days when there was nothing going on with the kids, whether it was school or billets or agents, if we came in on that third day, we called it seatbelt day. Put the seatbelt on because something's coming down today. Uh, there was a lot of seatbelt days in Ottawa. And it was a tumultuous time, but you did end up having one of the great runs in NHL history. And that's the, we call it the Hamburglar run, but it was a whole team effort. Can you take me through that particular time of how that all transpired and what it's like to go through? Yeah, we started out, we started out, uh, we went a couple of games before we got our first win. And I think it was a, I think it was a shootout in Boston, Bobby Ryan scored. So, so, uh, there's always an adjustment after, and then uh, we did a little bit of tinkering with lines and stuff like that. So we were starting to go, and then then we lost we lost Craig Anderson, and then then we lost Robin Leonard. And so when we lost, I think we lost Craig first. So we lost Craig. Uh, uh, Andrew come up from Binghamton, and actually he hadn't been doing too well in Binghamton. He'd been struggling a bit, but he come up, and it was a two week period. When he come up before Robin got hurt, in that two week period, uh, Wammer worked with him every day, and uh, he dug in and he worked, worked, worked in practice. He seen a ton of shots, and uh, and then lo and behold, Robin went down, and so I think I think at that time our, our other goalie was Dregs, who's in Florida now. Yep. So we come up, and right at that time, we were going on a five-game trip down through Southern California with a stop in Minnesota and Winnipeg on the way back. And uh, both goalies were out. And uh, I forget how many points we were at at that point. So we literally sat in, and I think, I'm going to say at that point, there was a little over 30 games left, 30. And so at, the, at that point, at that point, we sat in the office, and we, as coaches, we talked about, okay, this trip, obviously, this trip's going to make or break us. And if we come out of this trip with nothing, then there's no chance we're making the playoffs. And we all we went as far as to start discussing how we want to keep this team focused for the last 25 games after we've been eliminated. So we're on the road, and uh, the Hamburgers started strutting this team. The, the guys loved them. I, I think he really, he really earned the guys' respect in that two-week period. Where he just took a ton of ton of uh, shots and just stayed with it, and the guys rallied around him, and we just got on that magical run that uh, you wish you could uh, cap in a bottle and keep. Now, but I was told that you had, or you as a as a staff, and I will say Rick Wamsley is involved in this. No intentions yeah. of playing Andrew Hammond. Like you were waiting for Craig Anderson to get back, and you were just Robin Leonard was going to be the guy to play every game basically until that time. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, I mean for sure because because at that at that time at that time you know there was Robin Robin was looking to establish himself with us. Uh, there was at that time where where there there was uh, uh, a push to get Robin in, you know, to get him to get him some games. He was he was the guy that was going to be the next uh, goaltender in Ottawa. He was going to take over the net and and uh, he was going to be a goalie of the future per se. So yeah, and and the fact that the fact that uh, Andrew hadn't played very well in the American Hockey League, and we still were sniffing around, you know, to, to get that last spot for sure. Uh, Robin, we were going to run Robin until we see what happens. So you end up the last game of the season is Philadelphia. You need to win it. Yeah. Uh, so I guess did you say anything going into that game, or did you say anything throughout the run? Any kind of raw raw speeches. And what did you say to the team after that game in Philadelphia when you clinched the playoff spot? No, there, there was once you get on the run, there's nothing to say. You know, as as a coach, I think when you when your team gets on the run, you just stay out of the way. You know, you you just you just let them run, you just let them go. 
And uh, you know, at that point, at that point, obviously in the season, you're you're very you're very concerned about about um, the battle of practice times, you know, the schedule. And the one thing I do remember, and I don't remember the numbers exactly, but I, as we got closer, we were winding down. We had some games against non-playoff teams. I think we had Toronto a couple times, if not three times, and down the stretch. And and I forget what other teams and everybody was was saying, "Oh, you're going to win those those games." And I said, "No, those are the games I'm most concerned about because the non-playoff teams, the teams like like there's no pressure on them. You know, they're 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 the teams that can shoot for that secondary excellence and that they can just go out and play. And uh, and then we hadn't won in Carolina forever." Yeah. And we won a big, we won a big game there in overtime where, where Kyle uh, Torres hit the puck and I thought he was in a real good shooting area and he slid a nice pass to Stone and Stone and put it in the empty net and coming off the ice all excited and that uh, Kyle said to me because I was always on him but shooting the puck he was always I mean, he says I bet you you were able to shoot the puck there weren't you and so there was that good feel uh, between the coaches and the players that winning brings. And so you know, you just you just let them go, and and you just hope that uh, that the injury bug was over, and uh, and they just kept going. And a guy that a, a little unknown guy that played a huge huge role in that that really flew under the radar was Eric Conja. Uh, Eric Eric had that personality about him. He he was a huge huge influence in the dressing room, and he was a good influence. Uh, players gravitated towards him. Uh, you know the young guys in that Lazar, uh, Pajot, uh, and he he was he was a guy that that you know was our team. It was the face of our team at that time in terms of what he was, just a, a lunch pail type guy, simple, play the right way, and see what happens. So, did you after the game go in and say anything, or is it just another kind of game? No, it 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 was it was the only, the only thing is about about. Uh, I forget what point in the game in Philadelphia. I think I, I, we were up two one or somewhere back on the heels a little bit. It was a timeout, and I just reminded them there was another game going on, and I forget who the teams were involved. That we needed the outcome of that to guarantee us again if we lost. And I just remind them, hey, we're not going to let it. We're not going to worry about anybody else determining this for us. We're going to do it. And then uh, you know, Mark Stoll with his great stick did a track. He turned the puck over him. We went up three one, and. Uh, not that you ever sigh of relief, but you could just you just knew at that point that this thing was gonna gonna go home. And uh, but the the big thing for me, the big thing for me after that game was, I mean, it's obviously all the relief and that. But um, uh, we had lost Mark Reed. Mark Mark had uh, left the team, and he actually left it at the start or right after we come we come back from that that first road trip down into Southern California and that Mark had the moment for that. So a lot of our thoughts were with Mark at that point. Uh, and truly a sad story. I remember being on that trip in uh, California and, and just seeing uh, how much he was struggling and how much you guys were just there to support him. It was, that's a tough time for sure. Um, I want to bring up Toronto right now is dealing with Jack Campbell and Freddie Anderson and who they should go to, right? They're starting goalies out for a while and then coming into the playoffs you had that issue of, do I start Andrew Hammond or do I go to Craig Anderson? And Hammond, who had played, I don't know, whatever it was, 21, 1 and 2 or down the stretch. When Was there ever a decision to start Craig Anderson in the first two games against Montreal that series? No, but the first time, there was a story, but the first time we were going to start, Craig, was was we, come, we did the games in California, come into Minnesota. And I think Minnesota and Winnipeg was a back-to-back. So Craig... Craig was cleared uh, to play in Winnipeg. It was an afternoon game. And so we didn't go to the ring. So I had my press conference at, at the hotel. I was there. Yeah. And so at that point, the medical staff had, had told me that Craig's ready to go. And so Craig, Craig was, I announced Craig to you guys as a starter. So when I left, you guys are still in the scrum. When I left, Jerry called me over. He says, he just talked to Craig. Craig can't go. I said, what? He says, no, Craig. Craig can't go this afternoon. So you guys are still there. So I ran back over to you guys. And and I said, I said, uh, change here, guys. I said, I just found out and whatever. I, I actually had no details of what of what was going on there. So so uh, we had to put Andrew back in. So at in warm-up, Kyle took Andrew, Andrew couldn't stop a puck. 
So Kyle Perv's with him. So you all right? He said to Kyle, I am exhausted. I am exhausted. He never played that much in his, in his life in certain NHL level. He was lights out that game in Winnipeg. I don't know where he set, where he found that reserve tank. But from warm up, where he couldn't stop a puck, and Kyle told me that story a little bit while later, too. He was outstanding again as he was through that whole stretch. Uh, he found a different, he found the energy somewhere. And, uh, but that's, that's what has to happen when the team goes on that. And as always, there's always debate, you know, on, on, on your starting goalies and, and who's going to start. And um, so a lot of, lot of dialogue, but uh, I really trusted Rick Wamsley. Uh, I think he's an excellent job. I think he's an excellent coach. And Wamer and I, Wamer always had a big say, and uh, there never was any issue there, but there was always a lot of debate. So what would, would you change the now going back? I know hindsight's twenty twenty. We're starting the playoffs. Yeah. You mean? No. I mean we we lost we lost uh, game six one nothing. And uh, and we actually we scored a goal and that there was there was a quick whistle. Uh, there have been some shenanigans going on in Montreal between Stoner and and Subin. So anything around the net they they. Cracked down. There was a rebound come right at the puck. It was nowhere close to being frozen. And we scored, but the whistle went. The, the referees lost sight of the puck. Uh, so uh, hindsight, uh, no. I have no regrets. That's yeah, because I always – Hammond's always said to me, he goes, coming down the stretch, I think there was a game or two down the very end. He's like, I just want a break or I just need a day off. And no. he couldn't get one because he had really no goaltending to put in there. And you were on that no. that stretch. So – um, if I'm not mistaken, he had a new bed shipped to the Brook Street Hotel for him to sleep on because it was harder than what they had in the hotel at the time. But uh, lots of great stories from that run. Do you have a favorite memory? Uh, just just when, when you look back at that in, in hindsight, uh, you know, when, when you look is, is that we went from we went from, you know, being a long shot with no pressure to as we close the gap and actually get into the spot, obviously it shifted, you know, so now, now there's all pressure for, for me, for me, the best part of it was that, but how that never affected the team. And, and I think, I think that you take that moving forward in, in your coaching career is that, is that you read your team and, and you just find that rhythm. And I, I think for the most part, when teams are up and they're running, uh, you know the the coach the, the coach uh, is, is in the background. The coach is in is in front and center. Doesn't have to be front and center. And it's I, I always like I always like to use the analogy of of leadership. Is that the leadership I try to strive for as a coach when when I coach is is kind of like a a shepherd with a flock of sheep. Well, the, the shepherd leads from the back. You know he he lets his feet and nimble sheep get out front. And uh, every once in a while, you have to give them a little tap to bring them back in. But uh, you know, they're they're the ones that's that are that are running the ship, and, and the shepherd's just at the back. And yes, he's in charge, but uh, he recognizes it's the value is in the sheep, and they're the ones doing the work. Does Dave Cameron want to coach in the NHL again? I, I when people ask me about, about my career now, I, I I mean everybody wants to coach in the NHL, but. I, the way I describe my career now, my, my career is winding down. It's it's uh, I'm not chasing a career anymore. Um, I never was very good at, at networking and and uh, and selling myself. Uh, I just always believe that uh, you let your body work. Uh, you know, be your biggest advocate and stuff like that. And uh, there's just a lot of used car salesmen in the business now, and uh, it's it's I, I don't miss that part of it. Of course, I'd like to coach in the NHL, but uh, I'm not really chasing it. Would you come back to coach any? Uh, and, uh, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just curious. Like, would you do, would you do like a CHL, like a, a junior hockey team, or uh, would you ever come back to be an assistant coach in the National Hockey League? Yeah, I mean, I I would come back. I I mean, I I would consider coming back to right the right scenario in the American Hockey League. Yeah, I love coaching. It's, it's you know, it's it's. It's the passion, knock on wood. I'm, I'm, I have good health. I have good energy. Uh, for sure, I would. And I, I had actually, when it didn't work out in Calgary, uh, and I was, I was talking to Vienna. I had a chance to go as coaching GM 
on the Western Hockey League with Vancouver. And I thought long and hard of that day. They, they, I met with the owner and I got a real good offer from there. And um, I just I just at the same time had the offer from Vienna in Europe. And uh, after a lot of debate, I, I, I came to Vienna and I had no regrets in that. And then last summer, I had a real good offer from the St. John Sea Dogs, uh, the coach uh, in the Quebec League. And uh, they made it really interesting, too. And uh, uh, it just, I'm not sure, I don't know if there was a really reason why I didn't do it or that, but uh, I just felt that uh, I wanted another year over, over in Europe and things like that. And, uh, and uh, so it, it's certainly, you're always flattered when you get offers because I didn't go after those. So you're always flattered when you get those offers and uh, uh, you feel good. So I don't rule anything out. Uh, I'm always up for an adventure. I want you to come back just so you can give some young reporter a hard time when he does pregame interviews. Uh, a couple other questions. One is, uh, Matt can't join us today. He's too busy being a big TV star. And that is, who's more responsible for more gray hairs on your head, me or Mark Mathot? Well, I, I'd have to say you because Mark was a lot quieter. He, he just came in. He, he just did his, his job. And he wasn't interested in talking. Uh, what was he like as a player for you? Matt is one of those guys. I think as when I was there was was one of the last few that that was that bridged the old school new player. Uh, he was an old school attitude guy. I uh, played the played uh, the simple hockey. He was very content in his role as a shutdown D, get the puck moving, uh, physical, team first type guy. Uh, so he he was with the last there that that old school new new player. A uh, big part of our team, guys loved them. Uh, had a real good connection on and off the ice with Carl. Uh, you know, they were real good players for me. So uh, I, I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, I, oh, and I have another issue with you. And that is, uh, before you used to come up every day to talk to the media, you would always do a workout. So you would, and I, and it's like every coach has done this. It's coach for the Ottawa Senators, it seems. Even Paul McLean and DJ Smith, and I want to say Corey Clouston, is that, you come up, you're completely drenched in sweat. You run, you're out of breath because you've just done this workout. Why can't you just do it after? Well, I, I'm not a big sweater, so I think you're sweat, you're, you're examining this a little bit there. But it, it's for for me, it was quite easy because because exercise, even though it gets to hurry, now, that's what calms me. And uh, I, I'm a, I'd be a much better interview after I worked out as opposed to being wound up tight, that cabin fever type that I get if I don't if I don't work out. But uh, it was it was to impress you to maybe kind of a nonverbal clue to you that uh, the gym's just down the hall there. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I you know what I completely respect that. Is I but I thought that it, like the team was telling the coaches you need to work out before you come up to speak to the media because it shows that you're right in there with everybody else trying to do your thing. Is that at all true? No, no. Okay. The, be the best, I I'll tell you though, a, a quick story. The best benefit I got from working out as a coach in Ottawa was, I'm going to say it was one day roughly around four o'clock. Everybody had left. So I went down to the gym just to do my thing. And I'm coming out and I hear, I hear uh, the band playing that's, that's in Ottawa to play. And it was Bob Seeger. And he was doing a sound check. And so I went out just to where the benches normally would have been, right? And there was about, I don't know, there was 10 people maybe scattered around his crew that was setting up. And he went through all his old songs. He sang and talked about. So I had a, about a 40 to 45, I tell everybody, private concert for Bob Seeger, uh, who, of course, is it from my air, right? He's, he's from my air. So that was the best benefit I ever got from working at Mount. Um, what's that? So you brought up walking out that tunnel. So when you walk out that tunnel as an NHL head coach, do you still get like the chills as you take behind the bench, just like all the players kind of do when they take to the ice? Yeah, you, you, you do, you do, but it's also, it's also, you know, a quick, a quick refresh, a quick refresh of making sure you have your T's crossed and your I's dotted and everything's been addressed because, uh, you never get to the point where you think you've done covered everything for your team. And then especially in the Canadian cities at playoff time. Like, like you can just almost like you have to fight through that tunnel because the energy that's being pushed up from the fans coming back. And that's what makes coaching in Canada like really unique. 
are you following the NHL currently? Do you watch the playoffs? Do you have any horse in the race? Yeah, I, I watch. Uh, I watch now that I come back, obviously, because uh, to do it over in Vienna, it's, there's a five hour <laughs> difference. So, so it's um, on during the year, I'm basically a highlight kind of guy. Yeah, I, I, I watch it because because uh, you're always learning in this business. You know, you're always learning, and and when you're in it as long as I've been in it, uh, there's not going to be a bolt of lightning, and you're going to see something that's you know, wow, this is earth shattering. Uh, the tweaks you make now are, are the little things. And so when any time you can watch uh, hockey at its highest level with all the good coaches, I mean, that are at the playoffs this time of year, the good teams, you know, you're always looking. And then, of course, you hear the dialogue of what's, what teams are dealing with, how they deal with it. So each scenario to me uh, is kind of like a little bit of a science experiment. And so you watch it unfold and you say, like, well, would I do that? Like, how would I handle that if I'm there? So uh, you know, the hockey itself, the hockey itself is one part of the equation, but the other part of it is is how the teams play, uh, who's in what spot, uh, what do teams do. I mean, you watch, obviously, Toronto has to adjust now with JT being out. Uh, you watch Florida lost the first two games. Uh, uh, Joel changed his lineup around, changed his goalies. Uh, you know, you... you you listen to a guy like Daryl Sutter in Calgary after after his team's done, and he's talking about how how there's been a lot of a lot of players who, um, got preferential treatment in Calgary, let off let off the hook uh, based on where they were drafted as opposed to how they were actually playing. All things coaches want to say, but very few have the credentials he does to say it to get away with it. So uh, it's always interesting to see how players respond to that. Uh, I, I like that part of watching. Okay, so take, I'm going to ask you as a head coach, take me kind of through the John Tavares incident. And if you're the belief, if you're Sheldon Keefe, do you have to say anything to your team? And what's your reaction to seeing Nick Felino fight Corey Perry? Is that just he has to do that? What would you say as a head coach? I think as a head, as a head coach, when you see it as a player, there's probably nobody felt any worse than Sheldon. You know, like like because this guy is in the trench and. and as a coach, you always you always have a relationship with your players, but certainly have a relationship with your captain. So you have that sick to your stomach feel when you see any of your players uh, get hurt. But, but it was obviously it was a pretty serious thing. So your first your first instinct is you have to deal with your own sick to the stomach feeling, and then the next thing you do, you click in is okay. My whole team's feeling this. I, I have to make sure now that that when I know John's in good care, that's a great thing with the National Hockey League. You know the medical staffs. Of both teams would be there if need be, so you know there's instantaneous the, the top the top uh, Medicare people there and stuff like that. So you know that John's going to get what he needs right at that point. So now you just start looking at your team and saying, okay, uh, I got to get this group back. And I think that's probably the best the best thing that happened to the Felino fight uh, was that let's settle this right now. So nobody's running around thinking, well, do I got to get at Perry? Do we got to retaliate? That puts that all in bed, and I think it helps with the focus going back. So you're okay. You're okay with Nick Felino doing that. Like, there's a lot of disba- debate, as I'm sure you're aware, of uh, whether or not it's an accidental place, or whether he has to respond. You just think it has to happen to settle the team down. No, I, I, I don't think it has to. Uh, I think it's one of those scenarios that that when it did happen, people can say, okay, that makes sense. But I think also, if it hadn't happened, I don't think anybody would have said. You know, people said the same thing. They didn't have to do it. So I don't think there's a right or wrong there. But I, I do think Nick did it for all the right reasons. Fair enough. Uh, I went quickly a couple last questions. And that is, uh, in Vienna, and I know you're a big health food guy and you like to work out, as we've discussed. Is there like a Vien- Viennese dish or something that you really have gravitated towards? Uh, schnitzel. Oh, it's so good there. Yeah, with lots, with pounded with the mustard. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. It, uh, it's, I, I remember being there. It's very good. Okay. Uh, yeah. It is lobster season. It just opened in the island. Uh, you being the islander, are you a big lobster guy? Yeah. I enjoy, I enjoy my two or three feeds of lobster. Uh, it's uh, very fortunate here. I, I got some family that, that fish and I, and I got some buddies that fish. So uh, uh, I get lots of, I get lots of free lobster and seafood and stuff like that. So very, very beneficial that. I'm very fortunate here because, 
Uh, the lobster season is started first of May. We have two seasons here, one May, June, the other uh, August, September into October. And both have been very lucrative, which makes the community very vibrant. And uh, I, the, the community I live in, Tignish, is uh, it's a generous, generous community. So when the fishing's going, everything's going. I will now send you my email uh, so you can ship me up some uh, some free lobsters that you've been holding out on, Dave. How about I send you some pictures? <laughs> I send you some pictures I get my first feed. <laughs> Very nice. I, you know, I, I wouldn't expect you to change. So that's That seems yeah. apropos. Um, Matt does apologize for not being here. He does say hi, and he uh, wishes you all the best, and so do we. And look forward to seeing you coach behind the bench in Vienna. And if I can ever get over there again, I'm going to look you up. At least we can go have some schnitzel together. Dave, I, I appreciate you stopping by. My pleasure. Thank you. And a huge thank you to Dave Cameron for stopping by in our chat, quenched by whitewaterbeer.ca, proudly brewed in the Ottawa Valley from Blonde Ales to New England IPAs. Don't forget to use the Wally Mathot coupon code for 15% off. And don't go anywhere. Still plenty more ahead in the show. You're watching the Wally Mathot Show, powered by Barhaven Ford, the first and only dealership in Ottawa to feature Roush-inspired custom builds. Time for On the Points, brought to you by SportsInteraction.com. Sports Interaction is Canada's odds maker. Head over to SportsInteraction.com slash Wally and Mathot today to get on the action. Must be 19 years of age or older. All right, Math, five games on the sked tonight, but the big one is the Leafs and Habs. We kind of talked about it earlier in the show. Who do you like in this game? It's game three. It's in Montreal. Now, there, I, I know the fans aren't there, but there's still, there's the mystique and there's the you got switching lines. You could be able to match lines better if you're willing at home. Yeah. Tell me what you got. Well, yeah. And it's interesting because you would think, I think in most cases, this knowing Montreal and that passionate fan base that typically they'd have a strong advantage, but I, I, the whole mystique thing, I'm not buying into that right now. I think it's <laughs> an empty building. They lose all of that atmosphere. So, I, and, and I'm being honest. And yep. I think Toronto's going to go away with this one again. I think now they're rolling. They got momentum. They're getting secondary scoring. We saw Jason Spezza the other night. This is a prime example of a team that's got some confidence. They're reinvigorated after that brutal injury to Tavares. So they're motivated to win this for him. I got to go with Toronto. Okay. Well, what do you think then of Carey Price's game? Because he's the one, I, I believe he's the X factor in all of this. If he stands on his head, they have a chance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but any, if any goalie stands on their head, they've got a chance. But no, I do agree with you. Carey Price is that X factor. And honestly, you know, even if they mix in, maybe they sprinkle in a little Cole Caulfield, perhaps they'll give themselves an opportunity. But still, Toronto's just too deep. You and I, we've spoken about yeah. this all year here on the show. We know how good they are. And I mean, I mean, I know I have about five different favorites across the NHL, <laughs> but I do believe that Toronto right now has is a heavy favorite. In this series, so I'm going to stick with them. There's no question. I would have just appreciated had you said you picked the right team to win in game one and you just completely ignored the fact I picked Montreal in game one. <laughs> That's fair. It's all good. I got to give you props. All right. Well, we're both going to pick Toronto in game three. Who do you have as scoring the winning goal? Oh, you're going to put me on the spot with that one. You know what? I'm going to have some fun with this only because it looks like he's rolling right now. And I could name any of the top guys, but that's not sure. fun. Can I name two? Oh, for the love of, sure, sure. Okay, I'll name one. I'll name one. I'm going to go with my boy, Jason Spence. I was going to go with Hyman. I don't want to go with Marner Matthews. It's just too, that's too generic. I'll go with Jason Spezza. He's sort of that X factor right now. He's got a ton of confidence. He's got that old man strength. Jason Spezza. Th thank God I only said one because Zach Hyman is the guy I was going to pick. So I'm going with Zach Hyman. <laughs> To score oh, the winner. What an, what, an, what an original pick going with a top line guy. <laughs> he's, but he's the guy that he's come back from it. Anyway, I know. I, he's and he's a plumber. Get a lot of he attention. works yeah. really hard. Yeah. yeah. He reminds me like of Zach Smith type. Where he that. just, yeah. All right. Um, yep. It, it, interesting series. It's, and it's been crazy to watch and I've enjoyed it. It's a Tampa, Florida series. Tonight is game five. Lightning up 3 1. Is this series over? Over. It's over. I mean, there's and early on, and, and don't get me wrong, I've got every reason to cheer for the Florida Panthers right now. Um, I had them as my dark horse. Mind you, on my bracket, I had Tampa, so I kind of contradicted myself. It's unbelievable. But in any do. case, I know I'm I'm a mess. Uh, I haven't slept. So you know what? For me, it's simple. I'm I'm gonna stick to Tampa only because 
they, they've got that winning pedigree right now in their locker room. They've got the culture. They know how to close out a series. I mean, how do you not go with them? I, the only problem I have with Florida, and I'm surprised by this, and I shouldn't be, I guess, is their goaltending was ninth in the league this year. They turned it around. They had Chris Drieger playing really well. Now they're 15th out of the 16 teams, how, 464, how much, and 849 save percentage. Yeah, how much how much playoff experience does Chris Drieger have? Okay, so sir, then Sergey Bobrovsky, where are you? Can somebody find him? Can somebody page him? I don't I, know where he is. I don't understand. Like I, that's I I thought for sure that they might be able to turn the corner if they had yeah. if they continue to get the goaltending and they just they haven't gotten it. So no ch- no ch- there's no chance against Tampa. I mean they're 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 absolutely rolling right now. Although Andre Andre Vasilevsky his goals against is not fantastic either. So no, he's I, still a stud. It is tough to put a team out of its misery. So I'm going to say Florida is going to win tonight. <laughs> I love it. Okay, this is fun. All right. I'm excited. Uh, those, are the, those are the picks. Now go make yours. Sportsinteraction.com slash volume and thought. Sports Interaction is Canada's online sports book. Must be 19 years of age or older to play. Odds subject to change. All right, don't go anywhere. Craig is coming up after the break. You're listening to the volume and thought show powered by Barhaven Ford, Ottawa's newest and number one Ford dealer. All right, welcome back to the show, and welcome back, Craig. Time now yes. for Trivial Trivia. Yeah, presented by Gong Show. They're, they're, they're the best over there. So they've, uh, as you mentioned earlier, they've given us a ton of these Gong Show soft, soft kits to give away. So we're going to get right to, in one of those. Those are awesome, man. People love them. We've given away a bunch so far. Uh, so yeah, we're going to keep the good vibes going here. So um, as you mentioned, Trivial Trivia presented by gongshow.com. Um, um, also their hats too. That was something I wanted to mention too. Their, their hats are pretty dope. Uh, so if they got 70 different styles to choose from, go out, check it out. Summer's coming up. Uh, if you're like me, you got some sun this weekend. So throw a lid on, uh, gongshow.com. So today's question, we're going to rewind back to the Dave Cameron interview that, uh, Brent did. Uh, and we're going to ask, uh, which current <laughs> auto, uh, which Matt. current general manager. Yeah. Which current general manager did Dave Cameron score his first NHL goal on? If you know the answer to this one head on over to twitter uh and use the hashtag wally and Mathot, as well as tag uh gong show uh at gong show gear on twitter uh contest closes on tuesday may 25th at midnight and we're gonna announce the winner on our next show speaking of winners yeah. guess what we got another one this show so we uh we uh one of our newest partners here uh, uh bone saw sauce co they uh they hooked us up with a little bone saw sauce prize pack so uh if you remember from our last one where we interviewed uh we interviewed a couple of people roberto luongo or igor sokolov we, we picked the sokolov interview his was pretty good uh people seem to be digging that one in line it was kind of nice to yeah, see um, yeah. it's nice to see his... the, the billet family and, and the agent both have enjoyed that like it's nice to see that some of the stuff has an impact on those people and they appreciate it and so uh i just i quite enjoyed the the feedback we've gotten from that one yeah, yeah. So it's cool. A lot of people checked it out and they found out the answer to this question, something I didn't know before. But the uh, the question we asked was, uh, who is Igor Sokolov's favorite hockey player? So I guess growing up as a kid, even today, he's a big kid now. Uh, the answer, of course, Yarmir Yager. Uh, so shout out to at Zach underscore Maxwell 17, because uh, you just scored yourself a very sweet bone saw sauce price pass uh bone saw sauce prize pack uh and they they make the uh they're a local hot sauce uh, provider uh, in ottawa check them out on bone sauce sauce co.com i've tried to say that a lot of bees and s's in there it is hard to do yeah Yeah, it takes a minute yeah (laughs) Well, just maybe I we'll tried the uh, I tried the super hot one. We were talking about that I think before oh. the uh, final boss, yeah. final boss two thousand. It's legit. Yeah, yeah, it's got some yeah. it's got some punch to it. It's pretty good. It's good on pizza. That's what I tried it on. Wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. Sorry, I don't mean to trail off. And I don't want to make this any longer. You you actually put a good <laughs> amount of that. On, yeah. Like, oh yeah. I had a thimble of it that my wife had in her palm, and I bird fed out of her palm oh. a little thimble of that sauce. And my mouth was on fire for 30 minutes. Yeah. I can eat pretty yeah. hot stuff. So yeah, like it was, yeah. it was hot. I could eat it, but it, you're yeah. an animal. Jesus. It was, yeah, it was hot. It was good though. Did you, did, okay. uh, you uh, well, you're going to, you're not a spicy guy, are you, Brent? No, I'm going to use, there's a mild, like a Yoshi one. I'm going <laughs> to. <Yeah. laughs> no, and w- Wally's all about his vocal cords and they say not oh, to right. eat too much hot, spicy food and stuff. Uh, I, I'm worried about it. Yeah. I, not, I, I had a hot sauce once and I like on a, on wings and I, I wanted to die. So I, 
I, it's just a little nervy, nerve wracking for me. I don't know how hot it's going to get. And when my eyes water and you're supposed to drink milk, that's uncomfortable. Yeah. You just got to go in and you just give it a little, just a little taste, like a little touch with the lips. That's usually how you know. Oh, terrifying. All right. Anyway. Uh, I'll go try add some. Ones. Yeah. We add some flavor back to your steaks. <laughs> my steaks have plenty of flavor. Uh, that, thanks to our sponsors today. Uh, BEI, Bonisher Excavating, Whitewater Beer, Faces Magazine, Sports Interaction, Gong Show, and our title sponsor, Barhaven Ford. If you like the content, perhaps like and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Go watch us, or sorry, listen to us on our podcast platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, all those other ones. Um, but Meth, go get some sleep. And that is it. You have watched the Wally Mathot Show, powered by Bar Evan Ford. We'll see you next time. Well, like plenty of plenty of flavor on your steaks. Are you fucking nuts? <laughs> you you nuke your steaks. There's no flavor on them. Well, it's like, funny. I have one downstairs waiting for me. I haven't eaten yet. Oh, but, okay. All right, all right. But I'm not allowed. Like it looks. Pop in the mic. Pop it in the microwave, maybe. <laughs> yeah, get a, get a nice I should take a picture. Right just cooking my steak. <laughs> <laughs> I could just see that fucking that yeah. dirty leather boot yeah. waiting for him in the kitchen with like a like smoke coming off of it. <laughs>